Hi, Watch Anime Recap here. Today we'll talk about the 2011 anime film created and directed by Makoto Shinkai called The Children Who Chase Lost Voices. If you're a fan of his other animated works like 5 Centimeters Per Second, Your Name, and Weathering With You, to name a few, then you'll surely love this movie too. Most fans would agree that Makoto Shinkai's works always get compared to those of Hayao Miyazaki. This isn't surprising because Makoto is known as the new Miyazaki in the animated film industry. However, let's not dive into that and just appreciate this adventure, action, and romance film that made otakus from all over the world shed some hopeful tears. The Children Who Chase Lost Voices is also known as Journey to Agartha and has garnered several good reviews from fans and critics all over the world. The animated film follows the journey of Azuna Watase, a young elementary schoolgirl who's been forced to grow up quickly after her dad's passing. Azuna is an intelligent and responsible girl. Ever since her dad passed away, Azuna has matured to do all of the house chores while her mother is busy with her nursing work. Azuna spends her days alone, listening to the unusual music flowing from the cat's whisker receiver her father gave her as a souvenir. She's often accompanied by her pet cat Mimi, who has strange red markings on her fur. Azuna walks home to school and vice versa with her lovely pet Mimi. Mimi gets declared as a cat in the movie, but she doesn't seem like a normal cat, don't you think? Mimi kinda reminds me of Cerberus from Cardcaptor Sakura. That said, Makoto Shinkai probably has other thoughts about Mimi. Asuna is always on time when going to school. She receives the highest marks and a lot of her classmates envy her for such accomplishments. One day, their pregnant teacher reminds them to be careful when going home as a wild bear is on the loose. There have been many rumors about the bear attacking the other townspeople. One day, while traveling across a bridge to her clubhouse, she's attacked by a terrifying beast. The monster resembles a bear's physique, but it's scarier and more aggressive. It has humps on its body and a mouthful of slimy saliva. Azuna is saved by a mysterious adolescent lad named Shun. Shun's wound after fighting the beast is treated by Azuna, and they both listen to Azuna's radio later. They go to a secret hideout where there are medical supplies collected by Azuna. Azuna has a makeshift radio that's powered by several batteries and a crystal. The crystal allows her to listen to distant sounds and voices. Most are elemental and out of this world, but Azuna doesn't mind at all. In fact, she loves hearing strange voices. Shun explains to Azuna that he's from another nation named Agartha and has come to this location to look for something. He then bestows a benediction to Azuna in the form of a kiss on the forehead. Wait, Azuna's just a kid, bro. Azuna rushes out, telling Shun that she'll return tomorrow. Shun, now alone, stares up at the stars before falling to his death off a cliff. That night, Azuna's mom arrives looking tired and stressed out. She lights a cigarette and smokes before she enters their house. Being a nurse is a stressful job. It's no wonder Azuna's mom looks so haggard. Azuna's mom invites her daughter to eat dinner at a restaurant. Azuna is so happy and excited since she barely gets to see her mother. Sometime later, Azuna learns from her mother that a boy was found dead in the river, but she refuses to accept that it's Shun. She walks away and sulks in her room. Mr. Morisaki, a substitute teacher, is giving a lecture on a book when he mentions Agartha, the country of the dead. This immediately piques Azuna's interest. She goes to Morisaki after school and asks him about Agartha. Morisaki recounts that once upon a time, when humanity was young, it needed the supervision of Quetzalcoatls, custodians of the dead until people developed and no longer required them. They headed beneath, accompanied by a few humans. Following that, Azuna returns to her hideout to see another unknown boy who resembles Shun standing on the cliff. Suddenly, a gang of armed warriors known as the Archangels appear and attacks both of them. Shun's lookalike takes Azuna with him as they elude the black-suited men who are chasing after them. When the cave's entrance gets bombarded, the strange lad takes shelter at the subterranean entrance with Asuna, and the two go further into the cave. The two come across a Quetzalcoatl that appears to have lost its physical senses and assaults the youngster. He refuses to slay the gatekeeper, instead handing him his clavis, a crystal, and fighting back. The Archangels step in and murder the monstrous gatekeeper. The Archangel Commander catches Azuna and opens a portal to Agartha using the clavis. The Commander and Azuna are the first to enter the doorway, followed by the youngster. The Commander exposes himself to be Morisaki once inside, and the youngster reveals himself to be Shin, Shun's younger brother. Morisaki tells Shin that all he wants is to resurrect his late wife. Shin doesn't care about Morisaki's sentiments and leaves them in the unfamiliar world. Morisaki then tells Azuna that she's free to leave, but she chooses to join him. They both enter the realm through an underwater portal. Morisaki forces Azuna to go underwater and tells her that she can breathe in the water. Once inside, they and Mimi, who had hidden inside Azuna's backpack, travel to the gate of life and death, which can bring people's souls back from the dead. 
Shin gets informed that he failed his mission to recover the Clavis since Azuna mistakenly returned with a piece of one. Shin returns aboard the ship to prevent Azuna and Morisaki from spreading havoc in Agartha. Along the journey, Azuna gets kidnapped by the Izoku, a race of monsters. On the night of the kidnapping, Azuna falls into a terrible sleep paralysis as the Izoku monsters try to get her. Mimi tries to protect Azuna but is slapped hard by one of the monsters. She awakens in a confined space and encounters a small girl named Mana. They both attempt but fail to escape. The day darkens and the Izoku come, although they can only move in the darkness. During their escape attempt, they come upon Shin who assists them but is injured by an Izoku during the escape. The running scene is so intense you'd probably clench your butt while watching. Morisaki with the assistance of Mimi locates Azuna and Mana down the river, as well as Shin. Shin attempts to acquire Azuna's Clavis Crystal Fragment. He is, however, too weak to battle, and Morisaki quickly beats him. Azuna persuades Morisaki to accompany them while Mana guides them to her village. The villagers are first hesitant to assist the top dwellers, but the village leader persuades the guards to let them in. The elder allows them to stay in the hamlet for one night because they have brought Mana back, but they're not allowed to stay longer because top dwellers always bring bad luck to Agartha. That night, Azuna enjoys the place hot bath and wears a traditional dress. She asks Morisaki if the dress looks good on her. Morisaki dismisses her and says that the dress doesn't suit her at all. This man has some serious attitude problems, and Azuna too has obvious daddy issues. Meanwhile, Azuna visits Shin, but he tells her to leave him alone. This guy also has some attitude problems. Dude, relax. The next morning, Azuna and Morisaki leave Amaurot by boat, but Mimi refuses to accompany them. Shin awakens to see that Mimi has died. Shin, Mana, and the Elder then proceed to deliver Mimi's body to the Quetzalcoatl. Azuna's heart is in pieces yet again after Mimi's death. Shin resolves to pursue the villagers as they ride away to murder them to protect Azuna. Morizaki and Azuna are heading towards a cliff when they're ambushed by locals, but Shin magically saves all of them. Morizaki carries on after swapping his rifle for Azuna's clavis shard and urging her to return to the surface. Morizaki transforms from a cold middle-aged man into someone who cares deeply for Azuna. Morisaki truly wants to get his wife back, and even if he doesn't, at least he tried. I guess that's what love is. Meanwhile, Shin is fighting the villagers and is about to be slain when the villagers detect the presence of the Clavis Crystal at the Gate of Life and Death. They leave Shin, having abandoned his nation, to walk around aimlessly. Following Morisaki's orders to stay in the water at night due to the Izoku, Azuna travels aimlessly and wonders why she came to Agartha. She eventually acknowledges that she came to Agartha because she was lonely. When the water runs out, she is attacked by the Izoku, but she is once again saved by Shin. After viewing the Ark of Life drop, the two return to the ledge. They come to a Quetzalcoatl who is going to perish. The Quetzalcoatl performs its song before passing away to transfer all its memories into the world. At this point, Azuna realizes that the last music she heard in her world was Shin's song before he passed away. Now this revelation gave me some goosebumps. Imagine hearing the last song of your dying friend. It's a bittersweet moment for sure. The Quetzalcoatl promises to lead them to the cliff's base. They both discover and enter the gate of life and death at the bottom of the cliff. Morisaki has previously wished for his late wife Lisa's spirit to return, but her soul needed a vessel, and the only one available is Azuna. Morisaki tells Azuna she shouldn't have come, and she is soon possessed by the spirit of Morisaki's wife. However, this is inadequate. Morisaki must additionally pay. He agrees to give one of his eyes in exchange for his wife's return. Shin breaks the clavis crystal to free Azuna, despite Morisaki holding a knife to his throat. After a brief reunion with Mimi and Shun, breaking the clavis returns Azuna's spirit to her body. Before leaving Azuna's body, Lisa advises Morisaki to pursue happiness without her. Lisa loves Morisaki so much that she needs to let go for her husband to live. Another bittersweet moment is when you sacrifice your happiness for the person you love the most. Aw, love hurts. Azuna has returned to her natural self, but Morizaki is distraught and requests that Shin murders him. Shin reminds Morizaki that carrying the burden of a departed loved one is humanity's misfortune and encourages him to continue living. Azuna, Shin, and Morizaki spend some time together in Agartha before returning to the real world. They travel the hills together and ride horses happily. They all seem happy spending their last days together. Even Morizaki looks happier now that he's finally accepted that his wife is gone. Azuna returns to the surface, waving goodbye to Shin and Morisaki, who have chosen to remain behind. The movie concludes with an older Azuna gazing out her window at the cliff face where she met Shun and Shin. She then kisses her mother farewell and rushes to her graduation ceremony. The ending song has a kick that will make your heart hurt. Seriously, what is it with Japanese animated films that make you feel sad and hopeful at the same time? 
The movie teaches us that not everyone we meet in life stays with us. Some leave, others disappear, but some will truly leave vivid memories in our hearts. Subscribe for more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like. It really helps the channel.